they have a value of 50%. And of course, the final project will be 50%. Um, and the final project is simply a combination of all the, the, the different uh, activities that you would have completed. Um, we want to be able to use all of those skills to make one final output. All right. Um, completion simply means doing all the assignments, submitting all of them. The assignments should we beg you to try and submit them on time. It helps us to properly prepare for the next uh, session. And it also tells you what you actually don't understand. That's why we start 10 minutes before. So if persons actually have questions or, you know, if you have questions throughout the week, you want to email those messages, we'll be happy to respond to them. Uh, takeaways. These are the, the, the minimum of what we promise you. One, you will be able to observe, interpret, and apply scripture at a very high standard, all right? You will, be, you will leave here with an improved vocabulary, not just in English, but um, in, in, in the original language, Hebrew and Greek. Uh, you, you will be able to uh, at, uh, perform, uh, understand the scripture, by using inductive reasoning and of course, deductive reasoning. You'll be able to conduct a word study. Word study is very important because we know words evolve, words change in meaning across a varying, uh, what we call a varying uh, culture, country to country, people to people, generation to generation. And so it's very important that we know how to do a word study in order to understand the truest meaning of scriptures. You'll be able to complete a biographic study, which is basically learning how to investigate an individual. You'll be able to conduct a thematic study. This is quite common. Most persons, if they are called to preach, to do a devotion, to talk about scripture, to share at work, they normally take it from a theme perspective. All right. But we'll look at how we can better that. We also promise the heck to give you some tips that will help you to produce a final output in application, which may be used in the form of a lesser sermon or even your own personal devotion. And we also promise that you will, you will definitely uh, be connected to different persons across the world who are like-minded, um, people who are, you know, interested in understanding scriptures and of course, um, living by those scriptures as well. Uh, technological requirements, all persons are in today, but I'll just remind us, we need a Zoom app all right, and we need uh, Nearpod, and Nearpod is what we're actually using now. Nearpod sort of made the, 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 the following of the less a little more convenient, and that is our intent, that you will go through a session that, you know, you're a bit comfortable in doing. And Nearpod also allow for us, if I, if for example, I could put an activity that I want persons to respond to, and they could type their answers directly in there, and we'd be able to get your response right here and I could project them if I so desire. Um, uh, you will need a computer, all persons are on. So I believe you know already you need a computer or a smart device. And we recommend that you have two devices for each lesson. Uh, you will be introduced to online games like quizzes and of course Kahoot. All right, this is absolutely necessary because we don't want a class that is all lecture right? We want to, to empower you in such a way that when you leave here, whether you preach, teach, or you never did anything in church, you are going away with some new strategies that you may use to improve whether it's- Sorry, what is Kahoot? I'm not very technical. What is Kahoot? Don't worry about that. We're going to get through it. We're going to get through <laughs> it. No, well, I promise before the end of this, this um, orientation, you will know what it is. All right? Okay. <laughs> All right, and there is also Google Classroom where we intend to submit our assignments. Okay, great. Um, some tools that you will need for the job. If you're going, if you're serious about being a disciple, and a disciple simply means a student of the word. So, you no, know, we always say followers, but they were really student of the word. Um, and it's the same word from which we get discipline. So therefore we are to be disciplined. 
and when it comes on to, um, to the pedagogy and all that, um, this course is a discipline. So if you're gonna be a disciple of this discipline, you will need to be disciplined. And, and, and part of being disciplined is making sure you have the resources that you need. And that's one, a strong concordance, a vine. We recommend you have at least three commentaries. Why? Because commentaries are simple op opinions and views based on a person's understanding of scripture. It is therefore easy for persons to insinuate or to place their own views on something that is not necessarily true. So why do we need commentaries? We're able to cross-check what we understand, cross-check what three persons say, and we are better able to see the common, the common ground and be able to recognize what God is saying. All persons should have had their, co their course text is critical keys for biblical interpretation one. Um, and of course, you need a good study Bible. And when I say study Bible, I'm not talking about the app. By the end of this lesson, some of you are going to throw away some, or be tempted to throw away some of the Bibles you have and get rid of some of the apps that you actually have. Um, but you need a good study Bible, all right? Preferably, so the uh, uh, NASB, um, New American Standard Bible, and we'll tell you why as we go throughout this course. All right, um, just to remind you of some of the materials we have, we also have book two for persons who want to read ahead and step into book two. Book two is really going to be looking at um, the different forms of literature in the Bible and how we treat with each of them. So how do you look at epistle? How do you treat a proverb? How do you treat a psalm as opposed to how you treat a narrative? Um, that book is equipped with those tools to help you there. All right, wanna recommend um, you know, this, this book, Biblical Keys of a Faith Activation. Um, there are some principles in it, at least 14 principles in there um, to help you activate faith. And one of the words for, um, for the Hebrew uh, that means to hear is actually Shema. And so when the Hebrew people heard the word um, Shema, they didn't just hear, hear, they heard and moved to action. And so one other thing uh, with the body of Christ is that it's good to say, what a wonderful presentation. It's good to say, I've learned so much, but then we always fall short when it comes on to applying. All right, so there is, that's where the transformation is when we are able to apply. Um, it, this book travels with a twin. There is no prayer. There is no faith without prayer. And there is no prayer without faith. All right. So there is a power of the secret place. So one other thing you will recognize is that one thing that God does every time is that he first introduces himself. I am the Lord thy God. Who, whatever. <laughs> you know, he introduces himself. So it is from revelation that we're able to have faith in God and able to actually believe in God. All right, we do have some other material. This other one's in our faith book that is meant to help you to navigate through difficult times, help to perfect the attitude as you go through difficult times. And of course, this other one, um, the shameless persistence, which really, again, works on your attitude in prayer. So much for that. Now, what I want us to do now, we want to review some of the things. Hello, sorry, could you put up the first um, sheet that you showed? I missed that one. The first one, when you introduced. All right. No, no, no. Um, of all the introductory courses that you were doing, what we, we expected to achieve and do, the first um, slide that you showed. You're doing them too fast. I want to, um, I need to copy them. All right, we'll send, I'll send, I'll send, I'll send this presentation particularly to you. So um, if, if you miss something, I'll send this out to you. I've missed quite a lot because I was upstairs finding my book. All right. <laughs> and you're, you're going too fast for us. <clears throat> Just too fast for us. We've got old heads on our shoulder. <clears throat> so, right. you know. Uh, that's just because we haven't gotten into the lesson yet. This is just the, um, the orientation aspect. So when we do get to the lesson, I promise to be a bit more patient. <laughs> All right, great. 
Um, so what I want us to do now is to go to Kahoot. So you're gonna type play Kahoot. That is P-L-A-Y Kahoot. Um, so if this was my, um, sorry, if this oh was my gosh. story, I would have gone here and I would have typed play Kahoot just like I have it on screen. Hopefully I'll see my screen, let me see. Yes. All right. So, yeah. So it would take you here. When it gets here, you're gonna enter your game pin, which I'm about to display. And it's gonna ask you for a name. Again, you're going to enter. We're gonna use this as a means of recapping everything that I have just said. Remember, they say that you only retain a small amount of actually what you hear, but you retain more of what you do. So we're about to do something now, and this will test how much you have actually heard from what I've said, all right? But to display the pin, give me a second. So the game pin is going to be Are you supposed to choose one of these names to put as nickname? No, you make it, you put in your own name. Where it says nickname, just put your name. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to type, but it's not letting me do it. I think I'm having some problems on my iPad here. Um, it's not allowing you to type. Did you go to, did you go to like Google? Did you open up the browser? No, I didn't because it wouldn't allow me to do it. Oh, all right. Um, what I probably have to do is kind of, um, work with that. So this is well, she has to minimize her screen. Sorry. She has to minimize her screen, her screen and that's then a... open a new browser. So that's why. That's the same thing with me. I wasn't able to do it either. It wouldn't let me. Yeah, yeah. you have to minimize the screen. Minimize the screen with the rub down on it and then reopen a new browser. And how do I do that? How do I minimize the screen? Where does it say minimize? There's a, there's a small box at the top of the screen. You can click on that, I think. And it will minimize and then you go into a new, open a new browser. It's not All right, so one thing we're going to do is that uh, we'll- I can't get in. Uh, it says not... you're, you're in, see your nickname on screen, and I can't see my name. I can't get in at all. All right, what we're going to do <laughs> is, we'll, uh, we'll, um, we'll, 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 this is just a review activity to sh show you what to do. So what I'm gonna do is all the persons who you know didn't get to do this one outside of class, I'm going to connect with you and then you know walk you through the process again so that you'll be able to, to do it the next time. All right, don't worry about this. This one, you won't get graded for it. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I've got in, I've got in now. Oh, you're in, all right. See? Yeah, I've got in. I can see oh, my name at the bottom of the screen, yeah. Oh, oh, my my oh, God. <laughs> oh gosh. Yes. All right, resilient. All right, let me just quickly tell you what's going to happen. The question is going to appear on the screen. And so, for example, if I ask you, is the phone black or is it, or is the phone black? Um, you're going to have true or false. Um, true will be in blue, uh, false will be in red. All that is going to appear on your device is the color. So, you're going to click the corresponding color with what is on the screen. All right. So here we go.
Oh, did I remember to tell you it's timed? It's actually timed. All right. don't know. Sorry, I couldn't see any of the questions. Thank you. So, all right, that's just an introduction. So if they work out for you this time, trust me, we can connect outside of class and we can make sure it work for you. And um, so we can have a smooth set. So this is just introducing you to some of the stuff that we'll actually be doing um, as, we, um, as we continue to go through this course. All right, so now to the real reason why you signed up, the real reason why you are here, because ain't nobody came here to play no game. Everybody came here to do some work and so we're going to get right into that um today i'm going to get right into that so if i could invite you to go back to um go back to near pod for me so it's it's about joining near pod join.nearpod.com and we're going to pick up that lesson right here all right so if you're not able to get what there, you can always follow us on screen, all right? You can always follow us. The presentation will be on screen. Just trying to make it a little bit more comfortable for you, all right? So it's join.nearpod.com and the code is D as in dog, I as in India, T as in tango, Q as in Quebec, and P as in Paul.
It's asking for a lesson code. It's on the, on the screen. Okay, sorry. Not valid. Do I try? All right. So uh, let me just copy and put this in the chat so we can get going um, today. So the code is in the chat is DITQP and is all caps, all right? Just like what you did earlier today. All right. So now we're gonna get right into critical keys uh, for biblical interpretation. When again, my name is Rob Dunn and of course the co-teacher is Reverend Rodney. All right. So, so the Bible was given to man, not just for information, but for transformation. This is one of my favorite statements by a man called D.L. Moody and would have been repeated several times by one of my mentor, the Dr. Miles Monroe. Now, what, one of the temptations to come into this course is that persons may come in a course because they want to be deeper. They want to, they, they want to appear to have so much knowledge. But I want to caution this from the onset that the purpose of doing a course like biblical keys for uh, our critical keys for biblical interpretation is not so much that I will become deep. It is not for me to know so much that nobody else know, right? It is for me to be able to hear what God is saying. It is for me to be able to understand God's word. Let me hasten to say that God's word is not um, a book of encoded language. And so you have to have some special key to unlock um, what is inside of it. What it does mean is that I need to develop an approach. I need to find a systematic way in order to understand and to comprehend what is it that God is saying to me. I'm therefore saying that God is speaking directly to you. Yes, he does use us. He uses the prophets, the pastors, the apostles. But God wants to speak to you directly. He wants whenever you pick up his word to read it that you are understanding. All right. The other thing is that it, it is not to come to a session like this and say, whoa, it was an awesome presentation or, you know, you know, things went on and I got so much information. It's more than that. It's about applying that which you have heard. It is only through application that we can see the change. This is inspired as, as uh, Paul spoke to Timothy from prison. He said, preach the word in season. And note importantly, preach the word, which is the word of God, which is God's message to his people. And he's saying, communicate God's message to his people in season and out of season, whether it's good, whether it's bad. But then he said, there are three reasons why you are communicating God's word. You are doing it for reproof. The word reproof there means to point out where the people are going wrong. Whenever we go to God's word, it is not, it is non common that when you go there, you realize there's something that I am not doing right. There's something I need to improve. That is what the word of God is about. So there is a notion that I got a word for a group of people, or I got a word for the church, or I got a group. We need to correct that theology. The, God's word is first to the reader. God's message is first to his people. Whatever God is saying to you, are, are, are saying to other persons, it's a word that is coming to you as well. And so there's a call for us to first apply the word to our lives, you know, before we seek to bring it to other, um, other persons. So it's one for reproof, point out where I'm going wrong. Then the other word is for rebuke. Now, there are many who uses the word rebuke out of the context that it was originally intended for. And so we use rebuke almost as a synonym to condemnation. 
and to raise judgment on others. Permit me to say that the original word from which rebuke came from in the Greek actually meant to bring into honor. It means to show people that you are better than what you are settling for. Every time you communicate the word, every time you go to the word, it should point out what you're doing wrong too. It should show you that you are better than what you're settling for. You're, 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 you're better than this that you're holding onto. And the third thing that the word is supposed to do, it is for exhortation, means it's supposed to instruct me. Know that I know what I was doing wrong. Know that I realize that there's something better in me and something that God expects of me. How do I know accomplish what God wants me to accomplish? And again, that is why the Bible says, uh, faith comes by hearing, but not just hearing, hearing the word of God. And the word here, I said, comes from a root word, Hebrew, in Hebrew, called Shema, which literally means to hear, but to move to action. Know that I hear what God is saying. What is it that I must now do? And that is what the word is. Bible study is incomplete if there is no application. So therefore, uh, the Bible was written in order to be read, understood, and applied to one's life. That's the purpose why we are doing this course. Our main objective, our general objective, if you would, is to assist scholars to develop a systematic approach for interpreting scriptures and to identify and provide uh, an appropriate support for interpretation. Now we read earlier, study to show thyself, and this is from 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Study to show thyself, approve unto God. A workman, notice, notice the word that was used to describe the learner, a workman. Therefore, studying and understanding scripture is work. It is, it requires effort. It requires having a system in place. It requires us developing an approach to scripture in order to make sure that we understand. Clearly, if it says a workman, that means if we're lazy, if it means that we're just reading or just listening, then we may not understand exactly what God wants for us to actually do. So then uh, our specific objectives are, uh, for this lesson in particular. So our overall goal, it's like a carpenter or mesa trying to build a house. The big picture is to build a house. Um, our big picture in this course is for you to be able to develop a systematic approach and be able to observe and interpret and apply scripture. But to get there, there are some steps you have to take. So just like with the house, you may have to clean the property Next, you may have to, uh, what we'd say in Jamaica, line out the property. And then the third thing, we'd have to dig the foundation. Then we get our steel work and put in, and then we do the casting. We do it in a step-by-step -step approach, which then in the end, we end up with the house. So we are saying there are some steps we are going to be going through throughout this course that eventually will give us the desired outcome. All right, so that's one, define and describe hermeneutics. Uh, recognize the ways to interpret, distinguish between exegesis and eisegesis, very important. Implement the procedure of interpretation. And of course, describe the aids to interpretation, generate a word study. And alongside a word study will come a biographical study, a thematic study, and of course, and a final output which is a combination of all that you have learned. All right, um, Rev. Yeah, thank you, Sir Rob, and um, welcome scholars. Now, the task at hand has to do with hermeneutics, which is basically the art and science of proper biblical interpretation. This is what we have set out to do really in critical keys for biblical um, interpretation. So we're setting out on a journey and if you notice what the definition involves, it's an art, which means it requires a certain amount of skill, a certain amount of dexterity, being able to maneuver through the thing. And a science, which means that it is systematic in terms of its approach 
you're going to find that as you progressively move through the course, you're going to be using building blocks. And each block is going to be important until you reach you know, what is referred to as the final product. So every step along the way is critical as it relates to the output. Now, in terms of defining biblical hermeneutics, this deals with the method of interpreting the communication of God to man. So God has communicated with mankind, right? What we call a divine communication. And that communication is recorded in the volume of a text that we call the Bible. And there are a number of factors that are going to be critical and very important to our understanding because we weren't there originally when this communication was given. Um, Bible says that holy men of God spake as they were being moved by the Holy Spirit, as they were given information, as they were dictated to, and they wrote this thing down. So what we're going to find is that hermeneutics is the skill that we need to acquire to be able to understand what the text really means. What is God literally saying through the scriptures? So in interpretation or to interpret, and these are some you know, kind of definitions of what to interpret means. It means that we're, we're going to explain, we're trying to explain the meanings of words because for us to be able to improve understanding, we have to be able to, to know what the words literally mean. And um, there's something that we're going to touch on a little later on in terms of word meanings um, to expound, right? To expand upon the thing so that it really literally makes sense. Um, one of the classical definition of, of interpretation has to do with giving the sense of, giving the sense of what this is all about, or literally, uh, some folks have used the word interpret to mean to translate, to move it from an original forming and language into a corresponding language that you speak so that you'll be able to understand what is being said. Now, here we have the three basic levels of word meanings. And you're literally going to see how this ties into the whole thing of um, biblical interpretation or biblical um, hermeneutics. Now, at the basic, basic level, we have what is referred to as the lexical, which is the core meaning. That is the meaning of the word that you normally find when you look up the reference in a dictionary, right? So that's the dictionary definition of it. But what we're going to discover is that sometimes the dictionary definition can be at odds with the cultural and the contextual meaning of the word. So you can find, for example, a meaning for a word in the dictionary, but in terms of how it is used either within a particular culture or depending on the, the way it is being used, the meaning can literally change. So for example, you, know, you have the cultural meaning, which is based on the environment in which it was written. So what we are finding is that the meanings of words will be adapted to the culture that that particular word or those words were literally written in. Then you, of course, you have the context where the meaning is affected by how it is being used. And the example I use, I remember when I was in primary school and um, there was a particular gem that we, we, we used to recite that went something, you know, like, you know, Monday's child is this, Tuesday's child is that, Wednesday's child is that. But then it reached a point where it says that the child that was born on the Sabbath day is happy and bonny and gay. Now, I don't think we, 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 we say that, that gem anymore because of one word, which in terms of its contextual meaning, it has literally changed. Because in the original mind of the person who wrote that gem, gay simply meant happy. But if I were to ask Pastor Elijah, Pastor Elijah, are you gay? I wonder what he would tell me. Pastor Elijah, unmute your mic. If I was to ask you right now, are you gay? What would you respond? 
No. <laughs> you respond no. <laughs> you gay? Oh, oh. oh, oh you I, said okay. no. There are two things. <laughs> are you saying about okay or are you gay? No, I just asked a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> Because and, and, and you, gave, you, say it. You, you gave a result. No, it's a question. You gave a resounding um, no. Yeah. Right. Let's ask Sandrine. Let's ask if he's up. <laughs> Sandrine, are you gay? No. You said I'm no straight. also. All right, let me ask one more person. Just one more person to find out exactly if, I, if I'm on the right Ruan, track. Ruan, Ruan, right. Ask Ruan. Ask Ruan. Ruan? Yeah. Okay. Where's Ruan at? <laughs> <laughs> Where's Ron at? <laughs> yes, Ron. Unmute and tell me, are you gay? No, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> happily, happily married, man. <laughs> of one <laughs> wife. So, so you're saying that you can't be married and gay? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, let me ask the question here. Because we're looking at meanings of words. What do you think the word gay means? I mean, the original context, as I said before, it was meant to be happy. But as, as time has evolved, I think it has been ascribed to homosexual lifestyle. Okay, you know, so, so, so you never use that word to say I that never use it. No, I would say happy. I'm me glad. I'm happy. Yeah, right. I'm glad. I'm... Let, 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 let me ask one more person. Desiree. She, she responded. You know, she, she responded? She responded? Ask you what you mean. So she, I would ask you what you mean. I'd ask you to explain what you mean. Before you asked what I mean. And I said, are you, are you gay? I would need I need further clarification. You need further clarification. <laughs> and why would you need further clarification? Because, Depends of, on the because of exactly what you said. The word All meaning right. of the word has changed with time. All right. No, so if I said to you, I realize you received a package from UPS. Are you gay? <laughs> I still I would still seek further clarity. <laughs> no, but who the fool I mean? But I'm giving you a context. <laughs> Let's go back to Ron. Ron, you're half, you, you're, you're married. Are you gay? No, I'm not gay. <laughs> but look at the context. I'm I am happily happy. married. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying married life. <laughs> so because you're enjoying married life, therefore you are gay, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it means that I'm happy. <laughs> but, but, but you see what's happening here, Sir Rob? Then they, yeah, they have culture obliterated that word culture. out of their their vocabulary. Oh. All right, but but you, you see what I'm saying in terms of um, right. no notice that culture here is oh. overriding the contextual use. Yeah. So even though I gave you a context, right, that what would you? that would basically underscore the the dictionary definition. You are unwilling to accept the definition, the dictionary definition, because of the cultural constraints. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> All right. Now we have a procedure now for um for 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 biblical interpretation. We're, we're going to look at the the basic procedure. What is involved? In, in going through this. And there's a particular scriptural reference in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8. <laughs> okay, Desina, I hear you. If you're gay about the package. <laughs> All right. Which says, so they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Now, in this Nehemiah 8 and verse 8 reference, we're going to find the procedure for biblical interpretation. And, and one thing I will say to you, make certain you know the procedure for biblical interpretation. And anybody who has been at any level of education knows that when the, the, the instructor says, make certain you know this, you know it. <laughs> All right. So the first thing that we find in this particular text is observation. The law of God distinctly. They read in the book in the law of God distinctly, which speaks, which speaks to the whole matter of clarity. What do I see? So whenever we're talking about observation, we're talking about what, what, what do I see? Observation has to do with the fact that you are, you are looking at the thing and you, you are coming up with, 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 with what you can, can see from the text itself. 
right? Things are becoming abundantly clear. We also see that whenever you're doing observation, it is important for you to read the text perhaps maybe about 40, 50 times, because the more you read the text, the more things you are going to see. Have, have you ever gotten an exercise where they, they, they show you like a, a, a picture for a few seconds, then they ask you to try to remember what you have seen. This is the strength of observation. The more you look at it, the more you read it, the more you'll be able to see coming out of it. Now, once you've done your observation properly, the next step is interpretation, which means to give the sense of the thing or simply, what does this thing mean? Now, to do the interpretation adequately, there are a number of aids and guides that might become necessary in order to do a, a proper job of it. And some of them have, have been mentioned earlier in terms of your concordance, your commentary, and, and, and so on. And there's a plethora of, of other things, word study guides and, and so on that can be, be, be useful, but you're trying to find the sense of it. Because what you're going to discover is that an interpretation is not necessarily the same as a translation. Because in a translation, you're trying to do a word for word understanding of the thing, while in an interpretation, all you're required to do is the sense. And so for those of you who are Pentecostals, right, you, you look at, for example, a scripture that speaks about the, the, the speaking in tongues, the interpretation of tongues. And so sometimes you might have a whole long barrage of tongues and a very short interpretation. Somebody can speak in tongues a half an hour. And then interpretation is God is good. And you're like, what's going on here? Or you might have somebody speaking in tongues in English. And they are saying, like, I'm the God that brought the children of Israel out of that. I'm the God that did that. I'm the God that did that. Therefore, I'm the God that did that. And, I, I'm the, and then the interpretation, right? Dios es bueno. God is good. All right? So that's what, one of the things that um, one needs to understand. Now, once you've done the observation and interpretation, because we're looking at procedure, we're looking at the steps that are going, you're going to follow. The next thing is application. And in Nehemiah 8.8, 8, it means cause them to understand which means that if you are the presenter, the teacher, the preacher, the communicator, your job is to show the individuals how to use the information that you have given them. Do not leave it up to them to find an application. So application means they cause them to understand. So in application, it is what does it mean or literally how does it work? How does this thing work? How can I use this? I remember earlier we learned that one of the, the, the critical aims of biblical interpretation is to first be able to apply the scripture to your own life. So it must minister to you before it can minister through you. Let me say that again. Minister to you before it ministers through you. I, I think it was um, Charles Dickens that says that he's not bothered about the scriptures that he doesn't understand but the one that he does understand because he's looking at application. What am I doing with what I know? Don't ask for increased revelations until you have committed to walk in the present ones that you have received. <clears throat> so critical questions here to ask in hermeneutics. These are, these are really relevant questions. Number one, what was the meaning then? We weren't around then. We don't speak Hebrew. We don't speak Greek. We don't speak... Aramaic even. And, and, and sometimes the meaning or the understanding is hidden in that. We, we are not the original persons yeah. to which the communication was given. And so sometimes that poses the challenge in doing biblical hermeneutics, in, in trying to find out what the thing means. Because sometimes if you just take, and, and the example that we gave earlier, right? Because <laughs> if, if, if I was looking at Acts chapter 8 and writing it in a particular context, and rather than saying there was joy in the city, I, I said in my translation that the people were gay in that city. Are, are you seeing the hermeneutical challenge there? Because our understanding would cripple our ability to know the true meaning of the thing because sometimes we are caught in a cultural war and that might affect the whole thing. So the key thing now, we have to find out what was the meaning then in order for us to be able to know, to understand and to apply it within our context. 
we're also going to discover that in terms of scriptures, scriptures can be either prescriptive or descriptive. Not everything that you read is applicable to you. Some things are just to inform you. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, not necessarily our practice. Not everything you do. You, for example, you might read a scripture and Judas went out and hanged himself. Is that prescriptive or descriptive? Is the Bible just telling us something or giving us what to do when we are depressed? Recommending something. <laughs> right? And so it, it, it is very important that yeah. you, you understand, first of all, what did the original hearers understand from what was communicated to them? How did they understand that? So when you're bringing it now to our times, you're better able to put it in a context that would be understandable and very relatable. Yes. All right? Yeah. <clears throat> so we have the Bible, and we, we, we're, we're saying that the Bible is inspired by God. Greek word there, theopneustos, which means God breathed. And the text there, the anchor scripture there is 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, right? Which, which, which literally says all scripture, and you have to understand that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So all of scripture is God breathed, God given, right? And it serves a particular purpose, right? It is profitable. It is beneficial. And the scripture here outlines the, the usefulness or the utility of scriptures, right? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Then it tells us why that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So in other words, there must be a byproduct of us incorporating the scriptures into our lives. So the scriptures are written in order to produce a particular kind of behavior. And it's not just an adjustment that we're talking about. It's a complete change. So one of the things that we're seeing here is that God superintended the writing through human authors. So your, your personality would literally bleed through what they communicated. So for example, like a Luke that was a professional doctor, Notice that in the Gospel of Luke, he spends an inordinate amount of time, especially as it related to the areas of healing. He's very specific. He talks about the illness, the effects of the illness, because that was his passion. And, and what you'll find is that whenever you're writing, your, your passion would come out, would begin to be unveiled as a result, right? So anything you're passionate about would bleed through your writing. So what we're saying is that Yes, God spoke. Yes, they wrote. But they were human authors, and so their person personalities would come out in the writing. So, for example, a gospel of Mark that um, is basically Peter's description of the gospel, but Mark simply wrote it as Peter dictated it, all right? Because Mark was more fluent in terms of the language, right? So he got somebody who could write for him. And the essence of it now is that when you read Mark, you're going to see words like forthwith, straightway, immediately, because Peter is in a mad rush to get to the scene of the passion of Christ, because that meant more than anything else to him. And so you'll find that, for example, the Gospel of Matthew, that has a whole lot of parables and stories and messages concerning the kingdom, primarily because of the audience and the person that was making that particular writing, right? Those things are important considerations. Views of inspiration. And there are three basic views of inspiration. Remember, we spoke about inspiration, God breathe. Now, people have various theories in terms of what they think um, the Bible is all about. We have the liberal view, where in their opinion, they're literally saying that the Bible is just the word of a man. It's just a man writing his understanding. 
then you have the new orthodox view where yes it is written but we are trying to really find out what did god say because maybe the author didn't capture it completely correctly so we, we have to know interpret it right so that we can understand it because you know we have to try to find in all of this quagmire in all of this mess where exactly is the word of god then you have the last one which is the conservative or what we call the dictation model of inspiration where we're saying that the bible is in essence the very word of god so as you read the scriptures you are expecting and you're anticipating god to literally communicate with you and there's you have the scripture uh first timothy 3 16 17 all scriptures given by, by by god by inspiration of god and they are profitable when we say doctrine we mean that it contains a body of truth that tells you what is right then it tells you what is wrong that's reproof then correction it tells you how to get right and instruction in righteousness that's the application there it tells you how to stay right so it makes no sense to tell somebody what is right or wrong without informing them how to attain to the standard and how to maintain it so the bible gives you enough for you to be able to maintain a proper christian life Defining right. the task of hermeneutics. All right, so we're going to look at uh, hermeneutics, and we're looking at the various parts that uh, has to do with hermeneutics. And there are some terms we're going to come across. And one such, ter one such term is exegesis. And basically, this is a systematic investigation of scripture to unveil original meaning of the message. So in other words, I am... When, when I'm doing exegesis, I am standing between two worlds. I am standing between the world where it originally happened and I'm standing on the other side of where I'm standing is the world in which I am now applying this particular scripture. Therefore, I must begin to understand who was speaking, for what purpose was this mes message given? Was this message for description? Was it describing an event? Or was it prescribing something that the people were expecting to do? One thing we must always understand is that any scripture that was written, whatever the original meaning was, that is what it means today. You cannot come up with a new ideology for a scripture. It has to have the same meaning. Why? It was a standard of God's expectation then for those people, for the people who came after, and it is definitely for us. So what is it that God was saying then? What did he expect the people to do? That is what I'm trying to do. And now that I know, I am now able to apply that. So therefore, it is the process of pulling meaning out of text. What this literally means is that I don't go to the scripture with my own meaning. I don't go to the scripture with my own ideas. I do not go to the scripture with my own views. There are persons who go to the scripture with a kiss because they need to support a kiss. And so because I believe it is wrong to, it, it is wrong to be green, I will go and find something that supports, I look like it is supporting that. And I will miss due diligence. I will not do read the pretext. I will not study the context. I will not explore the post-text to see what was said. All I'm there doing is looking for something to support my claim. And we're saying that is wrong. Therefore, this is one of the reasons why we say a disciple is a student of the word. Is one who is committed to the word. I am going to class. I must I must treat the scriptures like I am going to class. I am going there to hear all that God wants to say. I'm going there to be able to apply that which God wants me to apply. I want for us, there's a scripture that is very common. I know it's common in Jamaica. Pastor Elijah will have to tell me if it's common in the UK. Um, and those persons who are in Canada, you will have to tell me. And, and the United States, of course, but Jamaica, definitely. 
There's a scripture in Proverbs 18, verse 16. I want you to go to that scripture for me. And I want persons to read it from the King James. Because when you read it from the King James, it feels like real Bible. It, it feels like, oh, it is, it is expressed. Please find um, that scripture for me. I want to have it. Someone can read it for us. Volunteer. A man's gift make it room for him and bring it him before great men. What do you mean? Yes. What does that mean? What does that mean? What, what does that mean? Well, the, the context they always use it in is about bringing up a person. <laughs> well, they, they sometimes they use, they use it for, for, <laughs> for offering collection and so on, but the actual meaning is about the gifting in actually the person, what God has placed inside of them, that gift will make room before, before and, and I think that's what it's about really, but it's normally used in a context of actually as well of presenting, bringing your, <laughs> bringing your offering and whatever your gifts and stuff like that is used like that as well. So, so I'm hearing two things coming out of what you're saying. You're yeah. saying there are those who use it for offering. Yes. I am, I am so glad. I'm so glad no pastor is on here. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 there and and you are saying that this is speaking to the how gift how, I, how, how I yeah. mm -hmm. that is how you interpret. I'm hearing something here. What I love about the Bible, you see. All of us can have our own views. God doesn't take that from us. But scripture only have one meaning. There is only one meaning in scriptures. I've heard two views on it. Anyone else can help us out here. Thank you very much, Denise, for sharing that with us. Anyone else want to share with us your, your, your take on that scripture? What does it mean? Um, I think it means um, that if you've got a gift, Mm -hmm. Or if you're very good at something, it will open doors for you. Okay. Wow. All right. Cool. Cool. That means I'm trying on here to teach, you know, because this might open some doors for me. All right. Anyone else want to add? Thank you so much for sharing that with me. Um, anyone else want to add? Way? I think, I think, I think in my interpretation for this scripture is um, if you don't have a gift, that means you can't give anything. Okay. But once you have something to give, it opens a way to, to a giver. That means I, I have a gift. I'm a giver now. I'm giving it. I usher away into the presence of greatness. You understand? Most times in the Old Testament, um, during Moses' time, you had to bring a gift mm -hmm. before you go into the, to, to the presence of God. You had to bring a, a sacrifice or something. So that's what it means. Without, without a, having a gift, you cannot go into the presence of God during Moses' okay. time. Okay. So that's what it, that's what that's what I get from it. Okay. So if I lack something, then if I don't have nothing, I can't go in the presence of the Lord. All right. Great. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Hi, I would like I, to. I, I, can I say? Oh God. <laughs> go ahead, Sonia. Which of us is being allowed to speak, please? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm Tamalcio. <laughs> Uh, I think it's speaking to honor and honor gives access. So it, I'm taking from the previous point made about bringing a physical gift, something mm -hmm. of substance, and that will give you the access as in the part that says makes room for you. That's what I believe. Awesome. Nice to meet you, Tamalcia, at last. Amen. <laughs> um, um, anyone <laughs> else want to weigh in? And uh, sure, thank you so much for that. Um, I think Sonia was trying to say something. I was. I forgot. <laughs> you forgot. <laughs> I could read. I could read from another uh, another. I mean, uh, scripture where it's it's the same same verse. It said uh, it said uh, where are we? Verse sixteen. A man's gift make room for him, and bring him before great men. Mm -hmm. Can I say something? Do I think it's um? It depends how you give the gift. Could it be <clears throat> like Cain and Abel? <laughs> one gift was accepted and one wasn't. Whoa, whoa! 
<laughs> I, I would also like to share some what yeah. I interpreted from it. A man's sure. gift. Um, it says, "A man's gift make room for him." And I, I believe that God has blessed us all with a gift. Yes. And it's a matter of us developing yes. that gift so that it will make room for us yes. as we as we work towards developing the gift. Because sometimes the gift, it as a young child growing up, we can we can see the gifts in our children. They might be beaten, the, everything they find, they're beaten, table beaten. And it's a matter of the parents seeing that gift in that child and right. developing the gift. And that gift will make room for the child in, in the future. Okay, okay. All right. Um, anyone else want to win? Thank you very much, Aza. For sharing with us now, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm just listening how how God's one little message has um, mm. some 500 views and opinions on it, and I'm just I listening like to over here. Yes, Abigail, go ahead. All right. So, um, in this case, I would replace the word "gift" with "talent." Yes. yes. <laughs> You want you so, just, uh, hold on, hold on. I'm not sure. Did, did you just take up God's word, um, Abigail, and take out and put where you want? No. Did, did you just do that? To get a better understanding, I would. I'm, no, I'm, I'm just saying know. to get a better understanding, I would use the word talent. So you are taking <laughs> out God's word, putting your no, word, Rev. so you can understand. Is that what you're doing? Yes, that's what you did. Sister well, I am going to put you in a little room. <laughs> I am going to put you in a little room. <laughs> uh, right, so a, gift, a, a gift can be a talent. A gift can be yeah. that's what God has given you. It's inside you. You bring it out. Yes. Well, yeah. Yes, sir. So in this case, um, it it would be just the same. It would I, I guess it's um for my the context in in which it is used. It would be like your talent, what you have, what you you know. It's not that as as um the other person, the other speaker um just said that you know what you 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 see yourself as or you know the talent that you have playing the drum, the talent of playing the drum. You garner that talent, you know. From your child, you see yourself um, doing that, and then when you garner that talent, when you develop that gift or talent, um, it will make room for you. You know, um, I guess some persons will say you will get money, um, favor, and all those things, influence. So, <laughs> yes. Well, this is interesting. I, 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 I I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to love the class. Amen. <laughs> I would say it's it's a it's a very tricky thing in a way because you gotta know first of all what kind of gift you have. You understand? Because as much as God gives gifts, the devil gives gifts too. Mm -hmm. So you have right. to know what gift you have in your hands. Yes. And who you're giving it to. Mm -hmm. You understand? Is for instance with the story of um, Jacob. Yeah. He may, for for him to reconciliate with his brother mm -hmm. he had to give he, he sent forth a gift first yeah you understand so he could make a way before he reached his brother but mm -hmm. even though we have a gift his brother was not interested in the gift that he was given because according to the story his brother have had all his gifts had all his that already you understand mm -hmm. but because of um i would say Jacob was looking for reconciliation and forgiveness from his brother, causing him to send all these gift ahead so that he could soften that person's feeling, <laughs> soften that person's emotion, soften that person, you know what I mean? Whatever hate we have could take it away. So what happened is that it depends on the gift you have in your hands before you give it to somebody else. And it would make a way for you. That's let's let's, let's proceed the point a little bit, Sir Rob. That Gershom, why would Jacob? What was what was Jacob trying to do with the gift? You you mentioned to soften Esau, but what was he trying to do 
Why do you think it's necessary to send that gift? Because you're onto something here. What was mm -hmm. the use of the gift then? The use of the gift, like I said, is for forgiveness, yes. reconciliation, because he was like afraid of his brother. He was trying to say, you know what? I want to reconcile my brother. This is the only brother I have. I want to make it right with my brother. So what, was the, what was the intent of the gift? I, I, I hear the word, but what, what, did, what was he trying to use the gift to do? Right. You're under something. His, the, I would say to soften his brother. To, you know, Change your bit. word, soften. Give me another word apart from soften. Come on. Right. Right. Right, you're right. well, yeah, my private. My private. My private. But but that's that that's how that's how that's how we have to look at it as a believer in Christ. As much as we look at it as bride, you know what I mean? It's it's a way whereby we have to find some ground. If we know we have hurt somebody or something, we have to find some solid ground on in for our self force. We have a look on our self force and say, you know what? For me to get, you know what I mean, reconcile with this person, is either I send a gift to this person and, or, a, or a note and, or a gift card or, or a homework <laughs> card or something and say, you know what, I apologize or something before you talk to them, you know what I mean? So you open that that way, you open that 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 door to say that force to me, like, you know what, is she open up or is this person open up for um, accepting forgiveness or accepting this gift or whatever? So it's, you're making a way for yourself. All right, so I'm going to win. Thank you very much. You, you are onto something. I'm going to try and see if I can come home. Uh, <laughs> here. I'm going to see if I can come home. You guys took me a far away, man. I, 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 was just in, I was just there being intrigued by all the information that has been deposited in this little minute of discussion. I want you to think about, um, think about Philippians 4 verse 13 in the meantime. But don't go there yet. I'm just telling you to keep, to keep it on the tips, uh, tip of your lip as we continue this discussion. Now, now I am going to say that um, the, the word gift that was used comes from an evil word, matan, which speaks about a physical reward and a physical gift. So this had nothing to do with talent. So I'm just putting this right out there. This, this statement had nothing to do with talent. It had nothing to do with spiritual gifts. All right. So um, I'm, I'm just putting that one right out the board. So all of those who said talent, all of those who said, you know, because me sing well, it will put me before kings. This was not what the proverb was, was, um, was suggesting, right? Though something might be applicable in a sense that if I sing well, persons will hear me and decide that they want to invite me to a concert or give me some money. It is not what is represented in text. And one of the things we have to make sure is that what we are communicating is what was originally intended. And that's why this word exegesis is important. It's the original meaning of the thing. Literally what the man was saying is that if you are willing to bribe someone or give them a physical gift, it might get them to do something for you. It might bring you before kings. So because you did something for this person, it may literally cause that person to feel so good that you did something for them that they may, they, they may open a door and an opportunity for you. All right, so it really had nothing to do with the talent. It really had nothing to do with any spiritual gift there about. Um, the story that um, Gershom chose was good. And that's why we're trying to, to push him to say the actual thing. Because what Joseph did, uh, uh, not Joseph, um, Jacob did, Jacob was sending the gift to his brother, hoping that the brother would pardon him, hoping that the brother would be ready to receive him. So it's a sense of bribing. And anybody who come from Jamaica, do I have any police officer on board? Or anybody know any Jamaican police officer? I was driving to Kingston one day and you know, just as I get right, Abigail knows where I'm talking about, man. Abigail, you know that stretch right there um, as you're, you're, you're coming down um, to go down uh, Albany, I think, there about. Um, and just as I decide I feel in good and I don't see any police, no <laughs> police on board, and I decided to put a little bit of my feet on the accelerator and the vehicle decided to speed up a little bit. Then came Mr. Officer running out and I stopped and he said, right or left, all right? 
literally, if I gave him a gift in that case, it would make room for me to keep going, right? <laughs> or else I would be going behind by. So while something may be applicable in a sense, it is, if you cannot use that particular text to support that this is what I'm saying. You might be able to find other texts that literally speaks to your spiritual giving or your talents when you, when you honor God with those, right? That certain things will happen for you. For example, a scripture like Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, honor the Lord with all thy substance um, and all the first fruit of thy increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Perhaps I could use a scripture like that to support a claim of that magnitude, but I cannot use um, Proverbs 18 and 16 because Proverbs 18 and 16 was literally talking about if I give a physical gift, then this might happen for me. All right. Now the quick one is, Prover um, is Philippians 4 verse 13. Anybody know that um, lovely um, graduation, um, motivational um, uh, verse. May I have a reader, please? Sure, I'll read. Mm -hmm. Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Good. Tell us about that scripture. Tell us what is your understanding of Philippians 4, verse 13. Me or you're speaking to the class? Yes, I'm, I'm starting with you and then we'll take about two Oh, more. nice. Okay. <laughs> You'll be the representative. I think based on the context here and the verses that preceded this one, it's in reference to what he said in verse 12. He knows how to be a base or to a bone. So whatever it is, he can do it through Christ. Ah, you're, you're onto something. So I, <laughs> I see, <laughs> I see Reverend Valentine being excited. Awesome, awesome. awesome. <laughs> because oftentimes we take this for motivation, just flat out motivation and, and, and create an image that, look here, I can get up and lift up a house simply because I am in Christ. I can do all things through Christ was straight at me. I can do anything that is out there. And this is not the this is not the truth of the context. Paul was speaking about being contented. He was basically letting you know that whether I am hungry or I am fed, you know, whether I am going through tribulation or I'm going through peace, I can do all things. In other words, I can go through any of these because of him who strengthened me. We're going to correct some more things about that scripture as well. The word do there does not mean uh, what we understand in English. In fact, that was a poor translation right there. It really came from a word that really means to endure or to prevail. So it is in this time of tribulation, or whether it be tribulation or good times, whether it be COVID-19 or no COVID-19, I can endure all things. I can be contented in all things because of him who strengthened me. And now I want to come home and, and make another point. Now in the English, Mr. King James says Christ in the original context, it doesn't, the word for, the word for, um, the word for Christ in Greek is actually Christos. And that word is not founded there. It's not there. All right. It's not there. And so, um, Rev, could you tell us that word again? In in um, what, what's the what's a Greek word? Um, there I was using. Okay, it's it's a it's it's a word that that is derived from um the power of the Holy Spirit, um and dumonai, right? That kind of 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 a right. thing. So it, it, it's not Christus, Christ. but it's something right. reference to the Holy Spirit. So it it speaks. It really was speaking to the Holy Spirit. Now let's let's see if we can find some context of Scripture to support what we're saying. What we saw in scripture is that the predominant member of the God are the predominant um, reference to God was always about the father. That is why it used words like Yahweh, which means the existing one or, or it means to exist and to be, you know, the eternal one, all of that. Um, and then when we get to the end of the Old Testament, this same father introduces his son said, um, the whole a virgin shall have a son. You shall call his name Jesus. 
for he shall save his people. So Jesus became the dominant being in the New Testament. But when Jesus was leaving earth, he left, he literally left. And he said, I will pray the father to send you the comforter or another comforter. Now the word in Greek um, for another is a word called alo. And what it means is another of the same type, you know? So he was saying, I'm sending someone similar to me who will be in charge or will be given the power to overcome and all, um, all the things. And so if Jesus was a healer, if Jesus was a deliverer, if Jesus was an advisor, if Jesus was a defender in that time, this is what the Holy Spirit is to us in the church age. So literally when it spoke about him, in, uh, it was a spirit of Christ. It was really speaking about the Holy Spirit. So I can be contented in all things. I can prevail in all things because of the Holy Spirit that resides in me. How does this match up nicely with scripture? What did Jesus say to the, 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 the apostles in Acts chapter 1 verse 8? He said, he said, Tari, wait for the Holy Spirit. When, he, when, when the Holy Spirit is come, you shall be endured with power. And then uh, you shall receive, well, you shall receive power. And the word power there comes from the Greek word dunami which really speaks to, uh, speaks to ability. So you will have the ability to be my witnesses. Being witnesses, being able to go through any trial, any, any trouble, and still um, be able to endure, still be able to represent, still be able to promote Christ. All right? So Paul was simply saying, because of him that live on the inside, right? Because of him that is in my life, I can endure all things so that was not supposed to be used no as just a flat out motivation you want to tell people that we can't get a degree you can get a degree so one of the things we're seeing here is while the principle that we are sharing might be true while you know while it might make some sense right we cannot use a scripture out of line to support what we're saying. It's a misrepresentation. It's almost like I go and say, Tamalsia told me this. That's not what Tamalsia said. That's a misrepresentation. All right. So that's what we're trying to pull out there. All right. Another of the common scripture that many of us would, would know about is Joel 2.13, I think. Um, it could be verse 13. Someone could correct me um, on there. For those purposes in Jamaica, we know we have invented a word and put in there, render your heart and not your garment. No, no, anytime I hear a pastor or any person who have who use that scripture, I know they have not read that, that scripture. I know they have that's just tradition. <laughs> they have just heard it. Yeah? You know, and I just say, Lord, have mercy. Because the literal word really speaks about render, and render means to tear. The context was that the people used to, you know, you know, people, you know, when I was going to primary school, there are times when we'd get in a fight and we weren't really sorry, but we would fight anyhow and just come say we're sorry. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm sorry for doing this, but you know, two days after I'm going to do the same thing again because I was not sorry, right? I, I really did not repent. And so <clears throat> it's the same thing here with the people. They were doing all the things, the sackcloth, showing that they were sorry and all that. But the, 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 the word that came to the prophet was really saying, look here, man, rather than doing all these things to say you're sorry, why not show us that you're sorry? Show us a repentive heart instead. And so please, um, some of the time, and this is one of the reasons why we end up in trouble, because we have a practice and most times it's rebellion. We don't want to change. And again, the word of God is about first pointing out where you're going wrong. Anytime we approach a scripture with, I don't want to change, then you will find a scripture to say that this is what the scripture is actually saying. And that's defeating the purpose of the, the message itself. All right. Um, another term that I, was, I, am, I must point out to us quickly um, is the opposite of exegesis, which is eisegesis. No. Exegesis is putting into script, well, pulling from scripture what is in scripture, pulling the meaning. This one is about a direct or indirect attempt to put a meaning in scripture that is contrary to its intended. All right. There's, a, there's an example in Matthew 24, 17. Let him which is on the house top not come down 
to take anything out of his house. Reverend. All right. In, in, in the Bible Belt, the south, you know, of, of the United States, um, this scripture at one point became very relevant because, you know, the preachers did not approve of a particular way in which the, 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 the women, you know, did their hair up in a bun and, you know, it would sit on top of the head. So they call it a top knot. So to try to get them or to discourage them from that particular hairstyle, the, you know, the, 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 they use Matthew 24, 17. Let him which is on the house, Spears. top knot, come down. <laughs> so they put a space between the house and the top and join the top and the knot <laughs> to defend the particular point. And we are saying that anytime we approach scripture like that, we run the risk of, you know, error. All right, another term that we must be aware of is proof texting. And this is a use of text to substantiate a practice, doctrine, or belief, which may lead to significant misinterpretation of scripture. I am particularly passionate about this one. Jeremiah 19, verse 10. I saw an apostle, an online apostle, um, telling some believers, tell some of his followers, send me the name of your enemy. And sow me a seed, send a, sow a seed into, in, in, into this ministry and text me the name of the believer. And I'm going to write it on paper. I sat on long enough to see the man write on paper, follow people name, put it down in a bottle of olive oil and promise that at 12 o'clock the next night, midnight, he was going to break buckle. I personally went on the next night because I wanted to see this play out. He went there and he broke buckles with believers name on it. His justification was Jeremiah 19 verse 10. Then shalt thou break butter in the sight of the men that go with thee. Remember what we say about the scriptures being descriptive and the scripture being prescriptive. Every time I'm faced with a text, I must ask myself, is this descriptive? Is this describing an event? Is this talking about something that happened or is this something that requires me to change, requires me to do, requires me to be transformed, requires me to bring to action? Now, let us look at the, the context of the scripture. Now, now, God was about to destroy Judah and Jerusalem. And so he said to, he said to Jeremiah, go before the people of, of uh, Judah and Jerusalem. And you're going to break buckles as an illustration showing them what is going to become of their nation. They were going to go into exile. They were going to be broken. They were going to be taken away from their freedom. And so that was an illustration. So we cannot use the scripture to support witchcraft. I'm going to move on. <laughs> we cannot use the scripture. And one of the things that we need to understand is the predominant message um, that is in the Bible. God's message is about restoration. If you read the Bible back and forth, his general theme is about restoration, reconciliation. He speaks about mercy and speak about love and all of that. So that really had nothing to do with what God was trying to say. We have to be careful of that. Now we have three categories of misinterpretation. And we find these in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles speak in them, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. There are two things, two characteristics that, that will guarantee, there are actually three, but two here, that will guarantee you um, ending up with misinterpretation. It, it is those persons who are one, unlearned, all right? And unlearned here is not talking about people who just, we're not saying people are dumb or slow. No, we're saying people who are not willing to put forth the effort needed to understand scripture. Dangerous to sit down and listen to someone who shares who is not willing to put in the work and to properly study the scripture. 
The second one is the unstable, not spiritually mature, not spending enough time in prayer and the word. One other thing, if this is God's message, then the Bible said, if you lack wisdom, then you must ask of him. And so we are saying if it's God's message and I don't understand, refer back to the source that is prayer. And the other thing is to be, be aware of what is written in the word. Then we have a third, um, a third, which is the unprincipled. This is found in 2 Corinthians 2.17. They have mixed motives, using the word of God for purposes other than God intended, perversion of the scripture because of ulterior motives. The word used as a sneer. So you, you, you want persons, you have persons on, you want persons to, 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 to sow into the ministry. Let's say you're doing a fundraiser. It is actually okay to come and say to the believers that we're doing a fundraiser. We're trying to build a church. Um, we want you to contribute into it. But to bring a message to them, telling them um, that the Lord is going to give you a house and a hilltop <laughs> just for them to give is a way of corrupting the word. Here's what uh, Corinthians says, 2 Corinthians 2, 7. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. The word corrupt there uh, in its originally con original context literally means to treat for personal profit. We do not study the word. We do not pursue the word for personal profit. No, it must be the sincere, the authentic, authentic use of the word, 100% real, no mingling with other things. The word is simply for reproof, rebuke, and exhortation. Now it takes me to uh, another point I want to make. I see time running with us. Translation. Translation is the process of converting a message from one language to another using the primary source document. What we mean by that is simply, um, it is, uh, it is converting the message. So for example, the Bible is originally written, most of the Old Testament written in Hebrew, uh, a portion of Ezra and Daniel was written in Arabic and the New Testament is believed to have been written in Greek. And you know, there are different versions of Greek. So you will hear that in other, in, in other space, all right? Um, so we are saying that it is a translation. If we convert from Hebrew to English from the original source. And we're going to see why this is very important that we choose the, the, this, the, the actual Bible or the tools that we use when preparing. Now, there are two types of translation that we are studying here. It's one formal equivalent. This one is a word for word translation. So it's literally translated a word for what it means. So in Spanish, it's hola. In English, it is hello. All right, word for word. Then we have what is called a functional equivalent. Now this one is dangerous. It is a thought for thought. So we will take something from Bible and, and convert it into something that is applicable to this culture right now. But one of the things we must understand is that culture always evolves. Culture is changing. And I'll give one context. There was a time when if you call a man old dog, a problem. Now old dog in a song, old dog like we, Old dog has become has, 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 has become a compliment. So if we found something in scripture and have converted it to a one meaning today, 10 years from now, that new thing that you 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 place or you translate it to be may not be true. So it can be accurate today, but not accurate tomorrow. And so we want to stick to translation that has to do with um. The, the formal equivalent, so to speak. All right, what I want to do now is to do a quick activity um, to bring out the points that I'm saying and to make sure that them, they make sense. So I'm gonna call on a few persons. You wanna have different Bibles up at this time, please, and thank you. Can I ask a question first, please? Sure. Um, you've just said something about, um, I don't know if I heard you right, that the scripture, it can be accurate today, but not accurate tomorrow. Is that what you said? Right, but context of what I'm saying. So we're talking about functional equivalent. That's a type of translation. So I may convert something that was said originally in the Bible 
to my current culture now, right? But the meaning changes later on. So for example, the word we're looking for happy is gay, right? Let's say mm -hmm. a scripture in Bible spoke about gay in one particular context. And we had translated that in a, in a Jamaican Bible um, to mean gay. Now that the meaning of gay kind of changes, what it does is that it's not an accurate representation of what the writer originally intended to say. Let, let me weigh in here. Um, there's a particular scripture where Jesus said, go tell Herod that fox. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So the King James calls it fox. Mm -hmm. Now, this guy, this, this, these missionaries were working with some people they call the Ifago people. Mm -hmm. And when they translated that word into the Ifagoan language to fox, and they were reading it before an audience, the entire audience began to laugh. So the missionary asked through translation, what's the problem? Fox, the term fox in their language literally means homosexual. So it was reading, go tell Herod that homosexual. So they had to find a word now that was corresponding, which should have been kuga or mountain lion. So, they, so even though the scripture has fox in its translation, for, for it to carry across the correct meaning, they could not use the term fox just like in some cultures um jesus is not referred to as the lamb of god they have they don't know a lamb they have never seen a lamb they don't understand lamb means nothing to them mm -hmm. but when you call him the seal s-e-a-l then it makes a lot of sense because the entire livelihood is based upon the seal yeah. and so herein lies the thing in terms of an equivalent that is functional that carries across the same it's message it. and the same it's idea it. all right Yep. They, they, there's also the, the one um, scripture in Bible where I think Jesus was making a point and he said, um, uh, exact scripture, uh, that, that scripture that speaks about if your earthly father, if you ask him for bread, he'll not give you a stone. If you ask for a fish, he'll not give you a serpent. Literally, in, if you were to bring that to some, um, to some culture and, and say that, and, and use the one about serpent. They would literally tell you no. They would prefer the they would prefer the serpent because <laughs> in that culture, in that culture, a serpent is seen as delicacy. It's, it's seen about it's seen about one with protein and and this is an expensive type of meal. So if you use that, they would say no. If my father really loved me, this is what he would give me. He would give me fish. <laughs> so. Um, that, that's what we're trying to say. I hope we answered that question, did we? Okay, ju just one more thing before you move on. Mm -hmm. uh, let me use something very, very modern. Mm -hmm. Recently, there was a lot of controversy um, uh, after the death of Maradona and the whole matter of the hand of God, as we, you know, the British people well know, in terms of that particular match where he punched in the ball into the goal with his hand and you know, Argentina went on to win. Now, in the South American culture, to be able to deceive your opponent that that is something credible or good. So he never thought he did anything wrong. But whereas in the British culture, that would have been an absolute no-no. In some cultures, Judas is seen as the hero and not Jesus, because Judas was able to trick Jesus and to betray him, right? So in some cultures, when, when, when they read the scripture and they spoke about everybody cheered for Judas and not Jesus. And so that's why you have to find an equivalent now that is able to bring across the real meaning and the real idea. Awesome. 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 Take it easy, awesome. Sonia. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, that, yep, 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 yep. That, do we answer the question? Do we, do we clarify? All right. Yeah. All right. Awesome. All right. We're going to do a quick activity. Um, uh, I'm just going to give persons <laughs> some scriptures. So I want to have three types of Bible of, available, please. Um, three types of Bible. I'm going to just call some names and tell persons to prepare for that scripture in that particular Bible. Because we're going to see the role of translation in, um, in what we interpret about God's word. All right. So the first one. Um, Jacinth, I'm going to start with you. King James Version, 1 John 5, verse 7. And Rev is going to throw it in the in the comment section. So just in case um, you know you didn't get it, it's going to be there. All right. I'm going to ask. Um, is it Sister Ramona? 
I, I want you to look for that same verse in the NIV version. And then Sister Lorna, I want you to look for that same verse in uh, the NLT version. So it's 1 John 5 and verse 7. Then I'm going to go down to my brother Gershom. I want you to look for Acts 8.37. Acts 8.37, King James Version. Um, so Denise, I want you to find that same scripture, that same one in, um, in the NIV. Um, Pastor uh, Elijah, I want you to look for that same verse in the NLT. So it's Acts 8.37. Check in my screen. Sister Paulette, I want for you to check for Romans 13.9. Romans 13.9, King James Version. All right, Tmalsia. I want you to look for Romans 13.9 in, uh, in, in the NIV. And then I am looking. So Sandrine, would you look for Romans 13.9 in the NLT version? Um, and then I am going to move across to, who did I leave off? All right, I'm looking, looking, who am I missing? Who sorry, I Pastor, I only have the um, King James. I'm so sorry, the new King James. That's what I have. I only have one Bible. Okay, try and do, try and use an app for now. An that, app? Okay. That, that might work. I right. see. Yep. Um, Mr. Rowan, please, sir. You should be saying amen. So I know that didn't call you. Matthew 18, 11. When I see the men in a man, I am going to give special preference to the men. Forgive me, ladies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's not on. Yeah, forgive me. That's all right. Um, uh, Brother Andre, I'm looking for another man. I want you to look for uh, Matthew 18, 11, NIV. Sir, sir, I am King James Virgin, right? Yes. Okay, good. And Andre is NIV. And I saw another gentleman. Is that Mr. Ricketts? Mr. Roger Ricketts. Yes, sir. I want you to find that same verse in the NLT version. Then I'm going to jump over. I'm searching. Uh, Sister Aza, I want you to find. Remind me what verse is that? Um, Roger. Matthew, Matthew 18 11. Matthew 18 11. NIV. Right. Yep. Yeah. So Aza. I want you to find St. Matthew 19, 17. Um, Nisha, St. Matthew 19, 17 in the NIV. So, so it was Aza is, is King James Version. Nisha is going to be the NIV version. And uh, then I need Abigail. Can you find that same verse in the NLT version, please? All right. Did I get everyone? Did I, did I miss anyone? Yes, yes you did. You okay. did. But that's all right. <laughs> no, no, no. We are fine to everybody. Sister Desreen, I'm going to tell you, find Acts 28, 29, King James Version. And who else am I looking for today? Terry. Oh, yeah. Terry. Terry, you are at, you're going to find that same verse, Acts 28, 29, in the NIV. And... Um, Sonia. Onya? Sonia. Sonia. Okay, right. So, Sister Sonia, please find Acts 28 29 in the NLT version. Who did I miss? Who is hiding? Juliet. <laughs> oh, yes. And so, because she was hiding past and past had to call her out. Pastor, she's going to find it in three versions. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, poor Juliet. Just to let you know, um, I was looking, I was looking in Matthew 18, chapter 18, but there's not a verse 11. All right, we're gonna come to that. Just search. Oh, but that's <laughs> so not your, yours. Yours is St. Luke 17. Yeah. Yours, <laughs> St. Luke 17, 36. All right. Thank you. Thank Send you. Someone, someone already made the discovery. I think this is going to be a great <laughs> the discovery already. All right. Uh, Pastor, Theron didn't get any. 
Oh, let me give you one. Um, find for me uh, St. Mark 15, 28. St. Mark 15, 28. You can find it in all three versions. In the meantime, did I miss anybody? All persons who I miss will have to give me three, you know. <laughs> all right, thank you. We're going to start at the top um, in the interest of time. So let's start with 1 John 5, verse 7. Can we hear King James Version, please? Okay, 1 John 5, verse 7. Yes. But there are three that bear record in heaven, the mm -hmm. Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And Make sure you have a pen. And yep. these three are one. Good, underline that, circle it, circle it. You will not forget this class. Let mm -hmm. us go over to the NIV. Person with NIV, 1 John 5, 7. But there are three that testify. Ooh. Oh, Is that short? Ooh. And it's done. Woo. Oh my gosh. Woo. <laughs> that is short. No, you, you, I told, check if some of the words follow. Maybe you got. No, 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 no. It Maybe didn't. your finger is on the word. <laughs> <laughs> Let me hear the NLT version. The first with the NLT. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> the first with the NLT. First John 5 7. Oh. Is there someone with that one? This one and this one, Elijah. Okay. Okay. I'm just looking it up now. Look. Uh, we come back. Oh. Yeah, come here. Well, yeah, we, we run along. All right. Underline that. That's one reason you need to decide on the type of Bible you have tonight. Let's move Ooh. on to Acts 837. Acts 837. King James Version, please. Yeah. And it says, and Philip said, if thou believe it, with mm -hmm. all in heart, thou mayest. And he answered and, uh, and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, very important scripture. Someone believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Can we have the person with the NIV? And I would have preferred if it's not the app this time, but if the app, I'll, I'll it's work. Nothing, nothing yeah. in it's nothing. It's not there. No, check oh my it God. all out. Oh my Look God. It, no, no, there's no, no. There's no, no scripture. Oh, oh. Look if it fall to the ground. <laughs> Sorry, let me am, check myself off. <laughs> I am going to ask the person with the NLT to come and read that same verse for us, please. First, is the hey, NLT. hey, there's nothing there. There's nothing. So what can we do? Go to King James. Yeah. <laughs> All right. There you go. Very important. Yes. Ladies and gen gentlemen, <laughs> permit me to say, now is the time you need to invest in an actual paper Bible. I know, I'm I'm a telling computer you. computer programmer by, by my secular profession. And one of the things is all I need to do is to change a simple code and I change the writing on all the, the apps that you have. Yeah. I can update your Bible. I, 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 I don't see it happening yet, but I believe shortly you will be hearing some things coming out in Bible. I know, Bible, yeah, yeah. Invest in a paper Bible. All right. One other thing you're going to realize is that on the NIV app, what they'll do is put a little footnote or a little link that in case you're inquisitive enough, you click on it, it will read. But all it is is a, is a link to another actual version. It's not in the scripture itself. All right. They have taken that part out. All right. Decide what kind of Bible you should have. Let's move on to Romans 13.9. Can I hear the person with Romans 13.9? King oh, James Version. I, um, oh. Mm-hmm. You were saying so then no, I was I was saying the footnote he actually said for two. Some the, manuscripts, some manuscripts include here. Philip yeah, said look, look yeah. at that. Some, yeah. some, some manuscripts. Some <laughs> manuscripts. Today, wow. Today, wow. So um, um invest people, invest. Let's hear okay. the, the person with King James Version. Okay, it's, Paul, it's Paulette, Romans 13, verse 9, King James. Yep. I'm sorry, I'm reading it on the app. For mm -hmm. this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And mm -hmm. if there be, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Awesome, awesome. And I hear what the NIV have to say. 
The NRV, NRV says, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, <clears throat> you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. And what is missing? Thou shalt not bear false witness. All right? So not only do they remove um, mm -hmm. verses, but they remove parts of verses. Mm -hmm. All right? And uh, let's just hear the, the person with um, Romans 13, 9 from the, from the NLT, please. That was me, but I wasn't able to find it. I'm so sorry. Okay, that's because it's not there. It's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> As okay. it's not there. All right. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to take one more and then people just note this scripture and go back um, and study them. Make sure that you know what we're saying. Matthew 18, 11. Let's have the King James Version, please. For the Son of Man is came, is come. Sorry, for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Mm -hmm. Please, please circle that, sir. Circle it and keep it noted. Let's hear what the King, let's hear what NIV has to say. I uh, didn't find anything for the um, NIV. Just gave me a link to um, Luke 19, verse 10. Oh, Lord. Awesome. See? <coughs> See, sir? It's not there. All right? It's not your fault. It's just not there. God, right. it was not there. All right? Let's hear what the person with NLT have to say. That same verse, um, Romans 13, 9. No, 18 Matthew. <laughs> um, Romans 3, was it? No, oh, Matthew, 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 yeah, Matthew 18. Matthew, yeah, sorry, Matthew 18, 11. Do you find it? Yeah. Not seeing that one. All right, it's not there. In some, what they're doing some app, that one has a footnote there. So that's not there. So it's not your fault, sir. It's literally not there. Let's look at one last one. Matthew 19, oh. 17. King James oh. Version, please. Matthew 19, 17. The King James Version. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Okay, circle why callest thou me good? Circle that part. And let's hear what the NIV have to say about that. Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus oh. replied, okay. there is only one who is good. If mm. you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Is that the same thing? No. Oh, no. Lord. So in one, in one is about why do you call me good? In oh, one, good. why do you ask me about what is good? Mm -hmm. So what we're saying, um, as, I, as I bring this, I'm going to have to run along for this one, but keep those verses and go and check them. The literal thing that we're seeing here is that the far we go away from the actual source document, um, the more issues that we will observe and the more inaccurate the scriptures are. All right, let's run. So another word we needed to point out is paraphrase, and this is a process of substituting words in a message to simplify the content, thus making it easier to understand. So, so what we're saying here now is, uh, this is just simply taking another Bible that is in the same language and substituting the words in it um, to make it easier to understand. And you should know those kind of Bibles um, from the activities. You should start saying, let me go and check before I, um, I, I, I apply one more scripture. All right. The other term I want to point out is transliteration. This is a process of relocating a word from the alphabet of one language to another. So for example, I do not speak, I do not speak Hebrew, but they use English syllables, English sounds, English-like words to help me to know what the word would have said in Hebrew. So faith, one of the words for faith in Hebrew is immuna. And permit me to tell you that immuna has nothing to do, has nothing to do with positive thinking. It is being it is being passionately committed to action. So for the Hebrew people, faith meant you needed to do something. 
All right. Um, we will see that as we, we go along. Another in Greek would have been pistis, um, the Hebrew word for pistis, which speaks about a firm conviction. And we find that in Hebrews 11, verse 1, which is different from what we find in Hebrews 10, 23. Um, that one was really speaking about, um, uh, that one was speaking really about elpis, which was speaking about your tangible or the content of your faith, so to speak. All right, another word that we needed to mention here um, on here is, uh, is observation. Now, observation is the art of noticing the details in a passage and give more insight into the meaning and ends correct interpretation. Paying keen attention to details in text. And what we're saying here is that when you go to the scripture, you must go there as an interrogator. Go to the scripture as an investigator. If you watch those law and order movie, you see them always asking questions. Where were you uh, between the hours of eight to nine? What were you doing? Who was with you? Asking all of those questions, all right? So observation is simply about what does the text say and what do I see? I am not putting any meaning. I am just checking to see what's in scripture. Now, there are some principles of observation and four of them being one, we need to analyze the tone. For those of us who deal with the, the whole English language, we know that the tone can speak a lot to what is being communicated. So we wanna look at the tone that is in the passage. We want to look at the, the overarching theme that is going through a passage. So yes, there's one scripture that says, Elijah call out beer to eat up some people. But when I read the Bible, do I hear a God who is just calling out beer to eat up people? Or do I hear a loving, merciful, compassionate God who wants to restore and to reconcile people? All right. The other thing that we recommend that you do is to actually create a write an outline of a passage. So when you go with one simple scripture, one simple verse, you want to make sure that you form out of it a outline. And we're going to explain how to do that. While doing the outline, there are some questions that you're going to be asking of the scripture. So we have some categories, who, what, when, where, how. So when I go to the scripture, who was it written for? Who was speaking? Who said this message? For example, a scripture um, that we often use, um, touch not the Lord's anointed, nor do his prophet no harm. While there is a good principle in it that you don't disrespect the past, and there are, that verse by itself, is not um, or, or, or cannot be used to substantiate that point. There are other scripture that speaks about honor, but that scripture was really a man by his own conviction named David who said, me, I am not going to touch the, 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 the Lord's anointed nor do his prophet no harm. So I cannot use it then um, because I don't want people to question my authority. All right, so you, you may find other scripture to use, but not that one. All right, good. So um, what I'm going to be doing is we're uh, yeah, we're out of time. So and I'm glad that we're on the end of the presentation. But for next week, I have one simple assignment for the class. I want you to read one verse, and I'm so intentional. One verse, Acts one verse eight. One verse. Why? Because I'm not sending you to see the scripture. I'm sending you to observe the scripture. There's a difference between observing and seeing. Seeing, I just see the word. It's just before me. Observation says you're going to go in details. You're going to check it out. You're going to look at it. And one way to do that, you're going to, you know, you're looking for the who, the what, the when, the where, the how in that particular verse as you go. I'm giving you one single verse to read. Can't say we're a bad teacher. We didn't give you a passage. We gave you one verse. And please do <laughs> spend some time and check that out for me. All right. I want to remind you, um, we have spoken about those already. That's a textbook. Those who don't have, you will get yours shortly. Um, book two, that's book two. And I told you at the beginning that this deals with different literary forms. Um, so if you want to go ahead and start accessing that from now, you are welcome to do it. Sorry, that. repeat the scripture for me, please. Acts 1, verse 8. Mm -hmm. And he shall receive power after the whole... I'm even reading for you. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want you to go and observe. You must know that I'm serious about what I'm saying. 
<laughs> read that scripture, observe, and do all you can with that. We will, um, we will convene again next week. I am going to be emailing out an outline, one for you to print it before, as best if you can get it printed, walk with a pen, walk with a pencil um, for next week class. So please don't come to class without your pen and your pencil, all right? Um, I know we're in the technology era and we want to do a lot of stuff. I still recommend that we use, you know, we go back to some of the old stuff. Um, you know, that we used to do. So get the paper printed and work with a pen and a pencil. We're going to be going through quite a bit of activities um, coming next week. So ask for you to do that. All right, we have come to the end. I'm now going to allow Reverend to come on and say his piece. I know he's going to ask you to select a quick leader. Um, <laughs> and so I'm going to leave him to do that. All right. All right. Um, well, you said it in terms of um, selecting a class rep, and uh, that person is going to play a very, you know, crucial, very significant role. I mean, I know some of you might not know each other, but um, I'm going to ask you to select that person just about now. All right. So, can we have some suggestions? Gershom Doden. Gershom. Yeah. Any All other? Right. Or do we settle with Gershom? Sonia. Yes, Sonia. we settled with Gershom. We settled with Gershom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, Gershom. <laughs> okay, Gershom, you rep. Um, here's what I want you to do. Gershom, Gershom. Just, just put your um WhatsApp detail and I want everybody just to send him a, a message. Who's Gershom? That... All right, he's gonna put... come Gershom. Um yeah. Yeah. Where's he at? Gershom is a man or woman, is he? Man. Uh, yeah. That's why I was so excited, man. <laughs> that's the man that I represent. Step up, step right, that, up. Gershom. That's his info. So we're gonna ask you to send him a WhatsApp message. Take right. down his info, send him a WhatsApp message, and of course you'll get your your number. Yeah, sure. So he'll be able to create the link. Because come <laughs> next week, come next week, um, you guys are gonna be doing the devotion. And remember, as was earlier stated, it's five minutes, five. and that should include everything in five minutes. A, a brief word. Maybe two yes. minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can, okay, one second. Is that every individual doing it or just Gershom? Uh, he's going to be coordinating it. He's going to be coordinating. So he'll, he'll, he'll select from among his audience. Right. Um, he'll let you know. I don't know how he's going to work his thing. I'll, and then I'll, the closing bit in terms of the prayer. <laughs> yes. Um, he's going to be coordinating that also. Great. And because of that, he gets to pray tonight. <laughs> <laughs> And we have got his number. He um, put yeah, he put the five, in the chat. Does, oh, does, okay. the, does the five minutes include um, the, the, beginning and, the beginning and the ending? Everything. 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 At five minutes to the hour, sir. Uh, <laughs> so, yes. So Father, God, Father God, we want to give you praise. We want to give you thanks for light and strength, God. We want to give you thanks for waking us up to see a new day, God, because... We don't know what would happen last night, God, but we thank you, God, for sustaining us and keeping us, God, in one peace, in one mindset, God. Thank you for bringing us this far to call on your name, God. Thanks for everything that you've done and still doing for us, God. Lord, we thank you, God, for the classes we've taken, God, everything that has been said, God, that it be a seed unto our souls and our spirit, God, and flourish, God, as time to come, God. Bless the teachers, God, bless every classmates, bless every individual here, God. Lord, let your word not go by, God. You take full control and read. Bless us through the day, God, and take us, God, to a higher level in you, God, as we know your word, God. Speak to us in, in a mighty way, God, through your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right, so uh, just one some, quick um, thing, one quick thing before you move on. Um, if you don't have a text and you have completed registration, um, if you're in Jamaica, you need to connect with me immediately. Um, just send me a message. If you're in England, you talk to Sir Rob. Then if you're in the States, you can or Canada, you can talk to either of us. All right? If you All haven't right. gotten your text yet and you have completed your registration, just touch me with one of us. Awesome. What about right, okay. if you're Canadian? I, 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 yeah, I said States, Canada. Yeah. Okay. Okay, one more thing. What, um, is, the contact, what is the contact number to, for, for Canada to get in touch with you? Um, 
I'm going to send you my number. Yeah, better put it in the chat. Oh, right, so, um, sir, 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 uh, Reverend Rabdana, what about the, 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 the PowerPoint? Will it be sent to us? Yes, okay, the, leader, the leader is out there, you know. So that's how I was going to tell you that. Um, uh, that's my number, by oh, oops, I'm sorry, I sent it, didn't send to the group, sent as a direct message. Um, yep, so it's it's going to be made available to all. In fact, for if you had completed um, the setup information, it would already be accessible. All the lessons are already accessible to you, for they're all on um, Google Class. I didn't get no, we didn't get a text. That's it. Well, the what text? The the number is in the my number is in the chat. Um, yeah. But uh, what I'm saying is that uh, you would have gotten these already. They're actually on Google Classroom, so you can gain okay. access. But I will, I will send them, and that's the purpose of the, the classroom, to make sure. We'll send the recordings each week as well um, from the class so persons can go back and look at whatever we have said. So once um, Mr. Gershom doesn't see it, then he needs to reach out and remind us that that, what, that didn't come out for you. All right? Great. Thank you so much for your time. Blessings. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. For those of you who have afternoon, for those of us who have night, we're going to enjoy our night. Big up to all my UK peoples. <laughs> all right. Blessings. Take care. Hey. All right.